This is a collaboration with Bentley House Minis. I'm making half-scale furniture and accessories for Ayers 124 scale Fairfield dollhouse. Ayers Fairfield is a half-scale Victorian dollhouse that was redecorated in the 1970s. It's occupied by a family of skeletons. Make sure you stick around until the end and I'll announce what my project is and show what Aira of Bentley House Minis made for me. I'm getting started by making this retro two-tiered side table. I chose this design because the dimensions are listed. I'm using 1 8 inch thick base wood, but you could also use popsicle sticks. I made a 124 scale pattern on graph paper and glued it to cereal box. 124 scale is half the size of 112 scale, which is why it's also called half scale. The cereal box makes it easier to trace my pattern piece onto my wood and I can use it over and over. I'm making two matching side tables, so I cut four top pieces and rounded the edges. Sanding the edges softens the harsh lines and makes the tabletops look more realistic. I used a coffee stir stick for the skirt pieces that go under the tabletops. For the legs of the table, I'm using these carved fancy toothpicks I got from Target. I'm using skinny bamboo toothpicks to make the rails of the table. These pieces support the smaller tabletop. I'm adding the pieces of the table to tape for staining. Each of the tables gets six rails, four legs, six skirting boards, and two tabletops. I usually use watered down brown paint to stain wood, but today I'm using proper stain. I'm staining before assembly so the glue doesn't block the stain and leave white spots. I prefer a darker look, so I tried some antique wax from Waverly on a test piece. I brushed a layer on over the original stain and wiped away the excess. I really like how this darker tone looks, so I painted the rest of the pieces. I'm assembling the top tier piece first. I added the skirting pieces made from coffee stir sticks, so it's easy to add the toothpick rails. Then I glued the four skirting pieces to the larger tabletop. The skirting pieces make it easy to add the legs evenly and give it a finished look. I glued the top tier onto the bottom part to complete the two tables. I don't typically measure or make patterns, so I made a simple 124 scale cardboard room box so I could eyeball the rest of the sizes. I copied the dimensions of this 112 scale room box and just cut the numbers in half. I used a scrap of this adhesive wooden flooring and some of this very 1970s paper to finish off the inside. Now that I have a 124 scale space, I'll be able to check the size of the items I make to see if it looks right instead of having to make precise measurements. In the 1970s, wall baskets were a huge trend, so I cut three different size circles from 10 count tapestry canvas. To make the sides of the basket, I cut a thin strip of the tapestry canvas. I glued the overlap to itself around the same circular item I used to trace the bottom. The baskets look too similar, so I painted two of them a different color and kept one the original. To add some variety of texture, I pulled a thread out of the middle sized basket so the edges are frayed. These little baskets came together so quickly and I love how they turned out. In my last video, I made the spider plant with a spider baby so I need a plant stand. I made a fourth basket and used a fancy toothpicks as the legs. I made this simple template for the leg placement to keep them even. To stabilize the legs, I wrapped some wire around a paintbrush and snipped it where the two ends overlap to make a jump ring. I attached it using wood glue and reinforced the joints with some super glue. 
Even after giving it a coat of paint, I thought it looked too much like a stool. Wicker furniture was a huge trend in the 70s, so I fixed it by closing up the sides. I'm making some teeny tiny eyeglasses using wire and pliers. The two loops are the frames of the glasses where the lenses would go. I bent the wire at a 90 degree angle from the lenses to form the sides. This teeny bend is the part that would go over your ear. I gave it a really dramatic bend just so I could cut off the excess. Many people have made wire glasses like this, but I'm adding a new detail. To make the frames more substantial, I'm adding a coat of wood glue. I used a tiny scrap of wire to redistribute the glue and get rid of any weird angles. I painted the dry wood glue to look like chunky plastic frames. This tiny bottle is filled with diamond glaze to add the look of lenses. I'll show you in a future video how I made these half-scale books. I always keep the wooden scraps from my miniature kits. I'm using some thin pieces of wood and food packaging to make a miniature shadow box. To avoid doing any measuring, I eyeballed the size of the frame I wanted and trimmed the wooden pieces in place. I used my pencil lines as a guide for cutting the pieces. I stained the frame with some watered down brown paint and painted the cereal box blue. I got these dry flowers from a Row Life miniature kit. I'm adding color to this smaller piece for some contrast and interest. I'm painting the dry flowers with some watered down green paint. I combined some more scrap pieces to make a miniature tray. I filled the hole in one of the scrap pieces with some hot glue and a little stone bead. I added a layer of white glue and some fine craft sand. The stone bead was too buried so I popped it out from the back and glued it back in higher. Ava made similar decor for her Beetlejuice dollhouse recently, so I thought it would be funny if I made one of these for the Fairfield. I'm using another bead to make a super simple teapot. I previously made a 112 scale tea kettle using a bead, and just like I did for that one, I'm using a sequin for the lid. I sanded the plastic so the acrylic paint will stick and it'll be easier to cover up the red. I'm adding a base coat of beige paint, and while it's still wet, adding some orange to try to match the bead. A petite round bead will be the handle on the lid. I'm using white glue and adding it to the hole of the sequin. This makes it less likely to fall off, and it's perfectly centered. I'm using a skinny bamboo toothpick to make the spout. As tiny as this is, I thought it still looked out of scale, so I shaved it down before attaching. You can use wire, but I like to take the easy route, so I'm using a thin strip of cardstock to make the handle. I shaped it around a paintbrush and made it strong with some super glue. I attached the handle with wood glue and coated it in a layer of wood glue to give it some smooth dimension. I painted the pieces yellow ochre, followed by a layer of gold paint. This half-scale teapot is the equivalent of 8 inches tall. It's time to go back to the 70s. I'm using a rectangle of cereal box and some sewing thread to make some miniature fringe. I wrapped the thread as evenly spaced as I could and added a thick bead of glue across the top. It's too tight to squeeze my scissors in there, so I'm freeing the fringe by trimming across the very bottom. I'm cutting along the glue line to create two pieces of fringe. Macrame was really popular in the 70s. I don't have the patience to make a bunch of tiny knots, so I'm using this crochet flower as a substitute. 
My fringe is the same length as the piece of cardboard I cut. I kept mine nice and long so I can cut the excess into a little point. I glued embroidery floss on the back to make a faux macrame wall hanging. In my last video, I made a bunch of plants from scratch and one from this miniature row life kit. This time I'm making the snake plant from the kit with some modifications. I'm folding this piece of paper in half so the leaves have color on each side. I call this a snake plant, but I've also heard it called mother-in-law's tongue. These are from a 124 scale kit, but I think the leaves still look too long. I cut the leaves in half and then rounded them so they look more natural. I did this for all of the leaves, so I ended up with twice as many. I'm sticking the leaves to a piece of tape with the bottom on the tape and the top pointing up. I'm making two plants. One will be taller with more leaves. The tape makes arranging the leaves super simple. I cut off the excess tape so when I fold it in half, there isn't too much covering the leaf itself or sticking from the bottom. To arrange the leaves, you roll up the tape, adding glue as you go or wrapping the entire base tightly with tape. This is the one that had fewer leaves. For the smaller plant, I made a simple paper pot. The white paper edge is really bright compared to the printed paper, so I covered it with a red marker. Snake plants have twisted leaves, so I'm adding some movement to mine by curling them around a toothpick. I'm hiding the visible tape edges using some faux dirt. This is finely ground coffee from a used K-cup. I locked the ground coffee in place using some watered down white glue. For the second pot, I'm making a faux woven basket. I'm using this tightly woven edge of the tapestry that has an orange thread running through it. The tape will be visible through the weaving, so I'm painting it brown to look like dirt or a pot. This edge of the tapestry canvas is the part you would throw away and not use, but it works really well for my project. Orange was a huge trend in the 1970s, so this will fit in well. The tape bottom is uneven, so I filled it with hot glue. I stuck it to my tile work surface to give it a flat bottom. Now I have two snake plants for the price of one. I roughed out the shape of a beanbag chair and tried it in my cardboard space. The squeeze bottle is liquid clay, which helps the clay stick to the aluminum foil, but isn't necessary. I covered the aluminum back piece and the seat with polymer clay. I smoothed out each of the pieces and attached them to one another. I looked at my reference photo and realized I was getting the shape wrong. I was making this look more like a club chair, so I filled in the front with more clay. I added the lines that look like the sewn sections between the pieces of fabric. I'm using a soft silicone shaping tool for this. I baked my little bean bag according to instructions. The color is a bit hunter orange, so I'm painting it a more subdued tone. Avera has been aging things in the Fairfield, so I'm adding some brown chalk pastels. I also like to use shaved chalk pastels to add some forced perspective with shadows. Miniatures are often too small to cast their own realistic shadows. I want this particular poof to look like leather, so I sealed it with gloss Mod Podge. I'm reusing this old piece of a vintage broken miniature lamp. There are still some glue remnants in the bottom that were tricky to remove, so I softened them with my heat gun. 
a heat gun or hair dryer softens glue and weakens the bond. Avocado green was a really popular color in the 70s, so I'm using this bead as the body of the lamp. For the base that sits on the table, I'm using a combination of a bead cap and a thumbtack. The lamp looks a little big for 124 scale, so I trimmed the top and pushed the lampshade down further. Now I'm using some reusable mold putty from Japan to make a different kind of lamp. This product is called Oyupla or Oyumaru and I got it on Amazon. It's supposed to soften in hot water after 3 minutes, but mine wasn't hot enough so I had to try again. The hotter water did the trick so I dried off the mold putty and removed the cat hair. I'm hoping to replicate the shape of this bead. To try to get the mold as tight as possible, I squished it into the middle and pinched it up around it. I left a small opening I can drop some resin into. My plan is to add these hot glue strands into the center of the mold to make it look like a lava lamp. For some quick transparent color, I'm using a red sharpie. Apparently, funky things happen when you combine Sharpie with resin because it does not stay red. Lava lamps work by heating the colored liquid inside of them so it rises to the top and sinks. The hot glue will simulate big blobs of liquid and these will be the little blobs. I removed the bead from the cool but still flexible mold. To be more precise, I'm using a toothpick to drop the UV resin inside of the mold. This type of resin cures under UV light. I bought clear mold putty, hoping the UV light would reach all of the mold. I can't remember which miniaturist recommended it, but I'm using this needle-tipped syringe to remove any large bubbles from the mold. No more bubbles, so now it's time to find out if this idea will work. I'm adding the flowing liquid inside of the lava lamp at different levels but going in the same direction so it looks more natural. The red starts turning orange but it still works really well for the 1970s theme. This little bugger would not stay under the resin so I have two blobs. I added all five beads and put it under a UV light to cure. UV resin is toxic until it's cured. I cured all of the resin on my tools and wore gloves throughout. The clear mold putty worked great and the UV light was able to reach all of the resin to cure it. I overfilled the mold so it wouldn't have an indent where I filled it. I'm clipping off the excess resin and sanding it. The sandpaper makes it have a cloudy appearance. I'm filling in the sandpaper gouges with diamond glaze. You could use resin, nail polish, polyurethane, or any other clear sealer. I used this aluminum tape around the top. I finished the bottom the same way. I cut the tape in an arc and trimmed it away and folded it. This tape is made from real thin sheets of aluminum with adhesive on the back. I made an aluminum cone for the base of the lamp. I stiffened up the hollow base using some more diamond glaze. You may think of the 60s when you think of lava lamps, but they were popular in the 70s too. I scored some free cardstock from a cell phone box and traced this tiny circular mirror. I'm making a sunburst mirror, but I don't want to deal with a bunch of complicated math or cut a ton of tiny pieces. I traced a larger circle around the smaller inner circle and made this spoke pattern like you'd see on a bicycle. Initially, I was cutting right triangles going in one direction, but it looked way too much like a saw blade. I fixed it by cutting off the aggressive point to make a much wider, flatter triangle around the edge. 
Sunburst mirrors often have rods or ridges radiating from the center, but that would take a lot of planning and work. I'm simulating the look using some wood glue in a precision tip bottle. If you don't have a bottle like this, you can create these straight lines by dragging a Q-tip or a pen tip or whatever you have through the glue. The mirror frame looked a little bit shrimpy, and this is supposed to be a nice big dramatic piece, so I repeated all of the steps with a larger outside circle. Since I drew fewer lines, the outside triangles are wider and flatter. The small mirror I'm using is pretty thick. If I just glue it to the two layers of paper, it'll stick out even more, so I'm cutting out the center. You could use a craft blade to cut out the perfect circle, but I cut a small strip and just use my scissors. When I glue this to the back piece, you'll never notice the cut seam. I used my X-Acto to cut the back piece since the smaller circle will cover this up and neaten the edges. Removing a half a millimeter of paper may not seem like a big deal, but it does help this little mirror look more in scale. I glued a thin piece of paper on the back to help hold the mirror in place. This cheap acrylic paint of mine doesn't have very good coverage, so I did two coats of gold. To cover the edges of the mirror, I painted this cotton cord black and then gold. If Avera wants to add some chalk pastels or washes, it would really emphasize the texture of this mirror. I'm making more wall decor with some strips of food packaging. Rather than cut two pieces of the same width, I added a narrower piece on top. This little bit of added detail makes it look more like wooden trim. To get the proper size of the frame, I laid my trim piece over the art I'm using. This is a sunset print from a row life kit. I cut the side piece the same way and used these two pieces as templates to create two additional pieces. To give my cereal box pieces some stability, I'm gluing them to some scrap paper. I'm creating the 90 degree corner by using this flock. After I had already glued everything down, I realized this piece had been cut wrong. I cut it so the skinny strip was on the inside instead of on the outside like the other three pieces. As far as mistakes go, it's pretty minor and they're very common in making miniatures, so I'll just leave it. I cut out the center of the frame with my craft knife very close to the edge and used scissors on the outside. I used wood glue to attach it and weighed it down while it dried for a few minutes. To protect the print and create the look of glass, I added some dimensional magic from Mod Podge. It caused a pretty wild warp, so I'm putting it under a couple 1-2-3 blocks to see if it'll flatten out. I'm using more art I pillaged from the Row Life kit. I'm painting a thick coat of gloss Mod Podge to not only protect the print, but also add some texture and brush strokes to make it look like a real painting. I used a similar methods to make this single layer frame, but this time I'm coating it in wood glue. You could let it dry like this for smooth dimension, but I'm adding a ton of texture using these caviar beads that are meant for decorating fingernails. I'm not sure I've ever seen a frame with this bumpy texture, but I wanted to use up some of the loose caviar beads that spilled in the bottom of my bag. I usually use black or yellow ochre as a base whenever I paint gold, but one of my viewers suggested red. I really like the warmth it adds. To emphasize the texture of the frame, I made a simple brown wash using acrylic paint and water. I used brown paint instead of black so it would be more subtle. I covered the bright white paper edges using either paint or a marker. The warp did mostly go away and it'll flatten even more once it's installed. I'm sending these minis to Aira as is, but I'll modify a couple of them myself. I'm using some of my testers enamel paint which is oil based. The colors included are somewhat limited, so I mixed up my own green. 
Now that I'm taking a second look at it, it really looks like a Dutch oven pot to me. I wish I had made a miniature lid for it. This is a metal 112 scale cereal or soup bowl. I'm using it as a half scale fruit bowl. I thought the red color on its own was a little bit boring, so I added some yellow enamel paint to the surface and swirled the two colors together. I got these styrofoam balls covered in gold glitter one Christmas season from the Dollar Tree. I'm transforming them into miniature oranges by painting them a combination of yellow and orange. The roughness of the glitter nicely imitates the texture of oranges. For some more fruit, I'm using some of these remnants from a full-size faux plant. They are perfect just as they are and look like little grapes. I coated my fruit arrangement with watered down glue to further help secure them. The glitter was still visible on the oranges, so while the watered down glue was still wet, I patted on some orange chalk pastels. The chalk pastels hid the glitter shine and gave the oranges a matte finish. Since I made two tables, it only seems right to make two chairs. The yellow clay I had was too bright, so I mixed in some orange and brown. For some structure and to use less clay, I created an aluminum foil center. I flattened the disc of clay and made it slightly higher in the back. I used my thumbprint to make an indent where a doll's butt would go. When I first started making minis, I ran out and bought a bunch of tools I've never used. I'm using this rolly wheel to create some holy lines. It wouldn't roll along the clay nicely, so I'm just stamping it into the clay. If you can imagine how this beanbag chair may have been constructed, I'm adding dotted lines along anywhere two panels would meet to make it look like stitching. Velvet was a huge trend in the 70s, so I'm hoping this beige flocking will give me a similar look. To get the fibers to stick, I painted on a layer of yellow ochre paint. I applied the paint in too thick and messy of a layer and too much at once. Some of the paint started drying before I had time to drop it into the flocking. This first attempt turned out really patchy and messy looking. There are multiple bald spots that have no flocking. To rescue this beanbag chair, I sprayed it with some rubbing alcohol and wiped away the paint and flocking. It cleaned up really nicely like it never even happened. For the second attempt, I applied the paint in a thin even layer and did one small panel at a time. I sealed the flocking with some matte spray, but you could also use hairspray. If I was doing this again, I would have emphasized the stitching holes before flocking by adding brown or black paint and wiping it away. The third lamp I created turns out quite interesting and I'd love to hear what you guys think of it. To create the main structure of a floor lamp, I glued four beads to a bamboo skewer using super glue. I drilled a hole in a toothpaste cap to use as the lampshade. The stark white is not very 1970s, so I created my own paper shade and cut it a little bit longer and taller than the cap. For the base of the lamp, I'm using this mysterious plastic circle I got on the sidewalk and a button. I added some thin strips of paper to the lampshade and dry brushed the base with bronze paint. This lamp is looking off to me, so I'm adding some more detail using some string from a gift tag. To straighten the string, I dragged it through super glue and held it tight while it dried. I tied one of these beads from Timu to the end of the string to make it look like a pull chain. I added a styrofoam ball to the top to make it look like a finial. There's something not quite right with this lamp, but I can't pinpoint it. 
Now it's time for my project announcement and to see what Aira sent me. I'll be making the Gryffindor common room in 112 scale. Aira made me these two chairs and sent me some extras. Up first, we have this highly detailed upholstered armchair, which is the chair I requested Aira make. I really love how she added the ruched detail on the side and used probably embroidery floss to add all of this trim on the front. This accent pillow is great because you can smoosh it into different shapes so it looks realistic. This little chair is an absolute work of art and I cannot believe it's mine. Here is a second chair, which is a bonus chair I was not expecting. I really love the design and she absolutely nailed the aesthetic of this chair. These tassels aren't in the inspiration photo, but it's one of my favorite details. I really love how Aira made the cushion and the pillow removable, so make sure you check out her video to see the clever way she did that. I am so impressed at how perfectly she captured the details in the inspiration chairs. On Patreon, Aira shared a photo of one of the chairs sitting in her fireplace room box that's made out of cardboard. As soon as this item was listed in Aira's store, I bought one immediately with the intention of modifying it to use as the Gryffindor common room. Aira also sent me these frames from her store, which will really come in handy since the Gryffindor common room is covered in portraits. She also sent this little stool that happens to look very similar to a piece sitting next to the fireplace in the inspiration photo. The extra material she sent will really come in handy throughout the room and for reupholstering the little stool. I would be very surprised if any of you haven't heard of Bentley House Minis. If you haven't, then the YouTube algorithm has completely failed you. I absolutely love Aira's channel, and it's actually what inspired me to start my own YouTube channel. I linked Aira's video in the description so you can see how she made these two chairs, watch her unbox all the items I sent her, and see a special gift I got her from Etsy. Thank you so much, Aira, for inspiring me to start my own channel and for doing this collaboration. The chairs could not be more perfect and I will cherish them forever.